Good morning. I am City Council Member Richie Torres, and I chair the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Count Council Member Kalman Yeager. The recent impeachment of President Donald Trump, which arose from a series of whistleblower complaints, is as good an occasion as any for the City of New York to examine with a critical eye the strength of its own whistleblower laws. Over the course of five years, from 2014 to 2018, only 170 New York City employees sought whistleblower protection. Out of 170 cases, only one employee received whistleblower protection. Ponder that statistic for a moment. One employee in a workforce of nearly 400,000. One employee amid $93 billion worth of operations. There is something wrong with this picture. Why on earth are there so vanishingly few whistleblowers in New York City? No one can seriously contend that there is virtually no whistleblowing in New York City because there is virtually no malfeasance, no mismanagement on which to blow a whistle. New York is far from the platonic ideal of good government. It is far more plausible that the lack of whistleblowing stems from something systemic, inadequacies in the whistleblower law itself, inadequacies in the manner in which the law is enforced, and inadequacies in the extent to which the public workforce has been educated about its own whistleblower rights and responsibilities. The public workforce often feels inhibited from reporting abuse, corruption, and fraud. That sense of inhibition flows from a fear of retaliation, from a lack of clear legal protection, and from a lack of public awareness about the full range of whistleblower rights and responsibilities conferred by local, state, and federal law. As we evaluate the city's whistleblower law in particular, the committee will consider the following descriptive and normative questions. Which parties are covered by the law and which parties should be covered by the law? Which forms of misconduct are covered by the law and which forms of misconduct should be covered by the law? What reporting requirements exist and what reporting requirements should exist? What enforcement mechanisms exist and what enforcement mechanisms should exist? And finally, what remedies exist and what remedies should exist? I, for one, have a series of concerns about the efficacy of the city's whistleblower law. First, the law is reactive rather than proactive. It waits for employees to fall victim to retaliation and then intervenes when the damage is done. It fails to protect former employees, prospective employees, and interns. It fails to protect against blacklisting, which is no doubt a form of retaliation. It fails to offer employees a right to a timely investigation. It fails to offer employees a private right of action, and it fails to offer them remedies clearly defined and enforceable by law. Second, the law emphasizes process to the exclusion of substance. That is, it is concerned less with protecting whistleblowers and more with prescribing the precise manner in which the whistle is blown. By way of illustration, if I, as a city employee, report corruption to a local city council member, then I am eligible for whistleblower protection under local law. But if I, as a city employee, report the same exact corruption to a local borough president, then I am ineligible for whistleblower protection under the law. Why should it matter where the information is reported or to whom the information is reported? The arbitrary nature of the reporting requirements reflects a disregard for the purpose of a whistleblower statute. The purpose of a whistleblower statute is not to micromanage how the whistle is blown or to whom the whistle is blown. The purpose, first and foremost, is to protect the whistleblowers from retaliation. A law that refuses protection to whistleblowers based on mere technicalities is counterproductive and corrosive to good government. In addition to evaluating the city's whistleblower law writ large, we will consider a proposed amendment, intro 1770, which would extend whistleblower protection to those who cooperate with the city council on oversight and legislative matters. Intro 1770 is only the first chapter in what promises to be a comprehensive rewrite of the whistleblower statute. As chair of the Oversight and Investigations Committee, I am on a personal mission to ensure that New York City has the strongest whistleblower protections in the United States. The committee's rewrite of the whistleblower statute is going to be informed by three types of testimony. 
First, we will elicit testimony from Ricardo Morales, who will put a human face on the arduous process of seeking whistleblower protection. Then we will zoom outward and elicit testimony from Greg Krakauer, who will offer an expert legal opinion on the workings of the city's whistleblower law, where it succeeds, where it fails, how it compares to systems elsewhere in the country. And finally, we will elicit testimony from Commissioner Margaret Garnett, who is in charge of enforcing the city's whistleblower law. The public will have the benefit of an anecdotal perspective, an academic perspective, and an operational perspective. At a time when the President of the United States, Donald Trump, is waging war on whistleblowing, we in New York City must do what we can to fundamentally strengthen whistleblowing in our own backyard. The reality of what we do here matters more than our rhetoric about what happens elsewhere. In the end, a strong whistleblower law is an expression of our commitment to good government. With that said, I will call up the first panel. Ricardo Morales, Robert Krauss. Can you? Can you raise your right hand? Uh, do you swear to tell the truth and the whole truth in your testimony and in response to questions from council members? Great. Do you have an opening statement? Yes. Okay. You may proceed. Oh, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is to support good government more than anything else. The idea that the bill that you're introducing or even your efforts go to that concept of good government, I applaud you. What is necessary here is that we must promote the public's trust in the integrity of government decision making, its transparency and accountability. You're doing that in such a great way in terms of oversight, additional oversight, and protections for those individuals, those souls who are willing to put everything on the line to expose corruption, mismanagement, criminal activity, conflict of interest, and any other thing that fails the public in terms of governmental actions. The fact that You have thoughtfully, in this environment, looked at it. You looked at the historical nature of whistleblowing. You look at the stats behind it. It's now an international, national, and local discourse about whistleblowing. And to me, it's all about good government. It's absolutely about good government, no matter how it turns out, and the ability for people like me to be able to come forward and not only be protected, but also get the message across that government works, it's good, and a lot of good people work at it. Thank you. Um, obviously, I want to, you know, it's, it's worth stating that you, there is ongoing litigation between you and the city of New York. So I understand that your limit to, we're going to speak largely in broad generalities about your experience, but before we go into some detail about your experience with the city's whistleblower process. Um, just tell me about your history of public service to the city. How long did you serve the city and what positions? Okay. I started working with the city in 1995 as the assistant general counsel at the New York City Housing Authority uh, for its housing litigation unit. Uh, then I moved on. I was promoted to a deputy general counsel at the housing authority. Uh, with more responsibilities, and then finally I became the general counsel at the Housing Authority and held that position for approximately eight years. From there I was promoted to become the chairman of the New York City Housing Authority um, and served in that position for a while. And then uh, during that period of time I was honored by the New York City uh, Conflict of Interest Board with the Ethics and Government Award, the highest award that you could get for 
uh, ethics in government. From there, I moved on to uh, the general counsel at the New York City Controller's Office. I was promoted to the first deputy um, controller uh, in charge of all of the operations, day-to-day -day operations of the controller's office. And from that position, I moved on to the deputy commissioner for asset management at DCAS, where I was in charge of the city's uh, real estate portfolio and over 37 million square feet of real estate, along with uh, this gorgeous building that we had here, and any acquisitions, dispositions, and leasing of properties of the city of New York. So you've served in high-level positions at the New York City Housing Authority, the Comptroller's Office, and the Department of City, DCAS, Citywide Administrative Services. Um, bef before your ultimate termination, uh, were you ever terminated previously, disciplined, demoted, otherwise poorly evaluated? No, uh, that, that had never happened. Never happened at DCAS, never happened at any other. In fact, my career is actually a promotions. Um, I am what they call a career professional in government. Um, uh, at my abilities and skills, uh, I'm a graduate of Amherst College. Uh, I went to uh, Georgetown Law School. Um, so I have a pretty decent background. And each one of those positions that I've held have been positions of enormous amount of influence, enormous amount of confidentiality, enormous amount of uh, dollar amounts, so hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of budgetary responsibilities, contracting, real estate deals. So I was at the highest levels of government when I was uh, in my 21 years of uh, public service. When did you apply for whistleblower status and how I, did you apply for it? I applied for it after my termination. I was terminated in February 24th of 2017. I applied in April of 2017. And what was the process like, the process of applying for whistleblower status? Well, the process was arduous, it was long. Um, with some communications, there were more lack of communication than communication. Um, it just seemed like a, uh, an empty gesture on the part of uh, DOI. Um, can I put it in perspective for you? Sure. Rivington was one of the biggest, I guess, scandals of, of the current administration in terms of the focus and the number of investigations and probes into that transaction on the Lower East Side. The New York City Controller's Office commenced an investigation in March of 2017 and finished it and published it in August of 17, 150 days. They interviewed 50 to 60 high-level uh, individuals and went over, poured over tens of thousands of documents, and they did it in five months. The Department of Investigations did the same investigation on the same matter starting in March and ending in July of 2017 for about 136 days, same routine. They interviewed dozens of high officials. They looked at tens of thousands of documents, notwithstanding the resistance that the Corporation Council had given to submitting documents, they issued a report, All right? The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York started an investigation on the same matter probably in February or March of 2017 and finished their ultimate uh, grand jury panel in March of 2018, which would be 12 to 13 months. I received a response from DOI in October of 2018, 18 months after I initiated my request for some kind of relief under the statute. That perspective, five months, four and a half months, a year of intense investigation, DOI was with me in most of those investigations. 
had the same documents that were used in the other investigations and still took a year and a half to arrive at a decision. And I was not that lucky one of 170 in that period, that five year period. So you could imagine my disappointment, but I was not surprised. Uh, a year and a half strikes me as, a, as an unreasonably long time. Um, dur during the year and a half, how consistently and frequently did DOI communicate with you? I'm, I'm going to let my attorney who was handling some of that, Robert Krauss, answer some of those questions. But I could tell you infrequent, and we had to kind of pester the Department of Investigation for some kind of response. Oh, and by the way, they did not interview me until probably July of 2018. Notwithstanding the fact that they were, I had been uh, cooperating um, with DOI. I'm sorry, so you went more than a year, a, more than a year after you applied for whistleblower status, you were not interviewed by DOI? That is correct. I was not, yes. Mr. Krause? Yes, uh, so my name is Robert. My name is Robert Kraus. Uh, I am a partner in the firm of Kraus and Zuklusky, and um, I do a fair amount of uh, work representing whistleblowers, including um, Mr. Morales. And um, I was representing him through the period of the DOI investigation, and I handled all of the contact with the investigation, um, with the investigators of the DOI, except for when they interviewed Mr. Morales um, 13 months after his, he filed his complaint. And um, I think it's fair to say that uh, I pestered them a bit about when they were going to interview Mr. Morales, because in my experience, the first thing you want to do when you get a complaint, or the first interview, is certainly of the complainant, usually. So it struck me as uh, very odd and um, uh, it didn't build my confidence in the process when it took 13 months to, um, to finally interview the complainant. And in terms of the communications, they were inconsistent. Can I, can I ask about that? Um, have, do you have previous experience with DOI's whistleblower investigations or before Mr. Morales? Uh, other, certainly other forums, yes. And Not with the DOI because... Okay. because but the in your experience, is it unusual to wait more than a year before interviewing the complainant? Yes. And is 18 months an unusually long time to complete a whistleblower investigation? Yes, it is. And what about the communication? How frequent and consistent was the communication between you and DOI? Uh, it, was, it was infrequent, and it was always initiated by me. And there were periods, uh, generally the answer was, we're looking into it, we're looking into it, uh, I would let a month go by, and then I would call again. We're looking into it. We're looking into it. And nothing would happen. They wouldn't ask even to interview um, Mr. Morales. And um, then after I continued to pester, uh, other officials at the DOI uh, got involved in every communication I had, which I thought was, was odd and a little troubling. And um, then ultimately, after I continued to push, they interviewed Mr. Morales 13 months later and then issued their uh, a rather summary report 18 months after his complaint had been filed. So when you received the final determination, and again, I'm not going to ask about details because of ongoing litigation, did it come in the form of a report or a letter? How detailed was the explanation? You want, uh, the, the, the explanation, there was really uh, no factual analysis, two conclusory findings, and it was two pages and three sentences. So it was not the kind of detailed report that one would expect as a consequence of an 18-month investigation? 100%. Um, Mr. Morales, what impact has this process had on your life? Um, can, I could tell you that from the moment of uh, my termination and retaliation for my being cooperative with the uh, 
with the probes and the investigations and the grand jury, um, it's been horrible. I, my reputation has been ruined. Uh, my employability is almost zero. Uh, the, the cost in terms of uh, just trying to find uh, gainful employment, a person with my kind of background, with my kind of education, um, after service in government should be able to pick up a not-for-profit uh, job fairly quickly. I got comments from uh, my social network uh, shrunk immediately. I got comments from people who I knew for many, many years. You're a little toxic, <coughs> Ricardo. Uh, you're a little radioactive. Uh, we have to wait. And then, uh, of course, the phone call stopped, the uh, invitation stopped, the, all this other stuff. I'll give you a, a, a sad anecdote. Uh, uh, for this holiday season, uh, was, we were going to go to a Christmas party, and we almost didn't make it. Um, it was an annual event, and my wife was kind of uh, sad about it. And I said, what's going on? She says, well, I wish that we could make it to the party. I says, because... Ever since this happened, we haven't gotten invitations to go anywhere, outside of family gatherings, of course. And, I, you know, it dawned on me. I said, you know, she's absolutely right. Before, we would be out more socially, et cetera, and be invited to it. That's another cost, right? Uh, I, I even feel that when I enter this building, right, seems like all eyes are on me, all Ricardo's around, um, as if though I'm some kind of plague. Um, Look, it's not easy. It's not easy on you economically, financially, reputation-wise, employability. It's not good on your health. It's not good on a number of levels on it, but I'll tell you something. And this is to all whistleblowers. Do not get discouraged, right? If you're gonna stand for something, stand for something that makes sense. If you're going to stand that you know that this is good government and you want good government and you, and you want to walk the walk and talk the talk, this is the price of it. Although, let me play, I guess, devil's advocate for a moment because in life we have to make calculated risk, right? Most of us are one job loss away from losing everything, our lives, our livelihood, our ability to support our family. And just based on what you were describing to me, you went from serving in the highest positions at the Housing Authority, at the Comptroller's Office, at DCAS, one of the few people of color in those positions. That's correct. To becoming, in your words, unemployable. That's a heavy price to pay. Right? That that's, is a heavy That's price. irreparable harm, arguably. So given that reality, do you at some level regret sharing information that set this whole process in motion? I do not regret it. I believe that the mechanisms that you're putting forth will help other people be a little bit more brave. It is not easy, but I do not regret doing what I did because I think if I'm true to myself and to my principles and I'm a man of faith, that I did it because it was the right thing. Having said that, not everybody has the same gumption or the same support system that I have, I have a beautiful wife who supports me for 37 years and takes, you know, takes care of me and my family. So I have the kind of support that I need when I get home. People may not have that. And it is a tremendous, tremendous burden on the family, on everybody else when these things happen. And as you get older, right, um, I always thought that I would end my career on a high note working for government as long as I could, as long as the government would have me, and that avenue is shut down from me, from the state, the city, and local. And when I have applied for jobs outside of the state, this whole situation has come up in conversations because, so, because of the newspaper coverage, right? Everybody admires a, uh, a person who has gumption. Nobody wants to be that person. Final question, what, what can and should we do as a city to break the culture of fear that inhibits whistleblowing? There has to be support for the individuals, right? This whole idea of me waiting 18 months, being interviewed 13 months after the events, when DOI was with me all the way through is nonsense, it's hypocritical. 
It's an abandonment and it's a betrayal. So how do you stop that? I think the measures that in this bill you have of having a 90-day period of time for the report to be done takes out a lot of the discretion and politics out of things because you have to act quickly. It prioritizes the work that has to be done. To, to think that you have 36, three dozen complaints on an annual basis and they can't get them out within three months, four months, or six months is ludicrous. It's because they're not, they're giving lip service to people who have to come in and report corruption. But when it comes to backing people, there's no backup. And what you're trying to do here, I applaud because at least you'll give some other whistleblower and other people some teeth so that they could go and say, yes, I am being protected. And that's what's important here. And I, I think that you got to continue, and, and even if it's an uphill battle, is to change that dynamic so that other people will come forward and say, yes, there's something wrong. Yes, there's corruption. Yes, there's conflict of interest. Yes, there's abuse of power. Yes, there are these things so that we can have a better government All right, so these donors don't control things, that there's no, there's no this criminality that's going on. And that's, that's what I say. That would be the message. I think the reason why I'm here and a lot of people told me, you know, you shouldn't go uh, uh, continue to put yourself in, 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 in harm's way by making public statements and public appearances is because I believe in this. I believe in government. And I believe that there's an honest way of doing things. And I support what you're doing 100%. Uh, thank you for speaking out. Thank you for your testimony. Do any of my colleagues have any questions? Or? Okay, we're going to call up the, the second panel. Thank you so much for your remarks. Thank you. Uh, Gregory Krakauer. Gregory, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. So. Okay. Mr. Krakauer, can you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth and the full truth in your testimony in, before today's committee and in response to council members' questions? I, I do. You may proceed. Do you have an opening statement? Yes. Okay. Uh, clear some water here. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. My, my, my name is Greg. Krakauer. I am of counsel at the law firm of uh, Getnick and Getnick LLP, based in Manhattan. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at Cardozo Law School, where I teach whistleblower statutes and corporate fraud, a course that I established in 2015 when I served as senior advisor and counselor to the New York State Attorney General. Uh, I played a leading role in drafting and implementing several state whistleblower laws, including the New York False Claims Act, and the views I express here are, are on my own. Um, let me begin by expressing my appreciation to you, Mr. Chairman, um, for inviting me here and to other members of this committee. Chairman, you asked me to, here to speak out about model whistleblower protections and aspects of whistleblower laws that this committee and the City Council as a whole can examine in order to improve and increase protections for whistleblowers in New York City. But first, I'd like to briefly comment on Intro 1770. Uh, the legislation uh, is timely and important. Intro 1770, if passed, will augment New York City law to ensure that there is no place here for threats and pressure tactics aimed at intimidating and discouraging whistleblowers from cooperating with the City Council. Eight million New Yorkers rely on the City Council to provide meaningful oversight of programs and officials that directly impact our lives. Such oversight is not possible when public officials or others fear for their livelihood and possibly even their safety when cooperating with the Council. Intro 1770 is a good first step, Mr. Chairman, in your desire to examine a wide array of potential improvements to the city's whistleblower laws, and it is an effort that all New Yorkers should applaud. Where, where should the city start when considering adopting new whistleblower laws? Just on a broad level, all whistleblower laws do one or more of three critical things. Protect whistleblowers, reward whistleblowers, 
and or empower whistleblowers. And from experience, the best do all three. First, protection. At a minimum, any whistleblower law should protect whistleblowers from unnecessary disclosure and from retaliation by employers. Superior laws also protect against industry-wide blacklisting and recognize that in the so-called gig economy, independent contractors and agents need protection as well. And too often, protection is couched in terms of merely providing back pay and hypothetical reinstatement for a whistleblower who has the fortitude and stamina to win a lawsuit. A whistleblower who has won a retaliation lawsuit has lost more than just pay. As some New York laws actually recognize, but not others, real protection requires awarding whistleblowers at a minimum double back pay, interest, and costs. And it, it bears mentioning, few whistleblowers wish to return to work for an employer or contractor who has retaliated against them. Um, second is rewards. There are some federal and state programs that reward whistleblowers with their percentages of damages and penalties that government agencies recover because of information they provide and because of their bravery. The SEC, the CFTC, the IRS run such programs, as do some states. They have been remarkably successful and endorsed across the political spectrum. City agencies that have the power to levy significant fines against large-scale illegal activities by major corporations should welcome the adoption of similar programs here in New York City to incentivize whistleblowers who can bring serious illegal activity to light. And the third is empowerment. Some laws, in addition to rewarding whistleblowers, grant them the right to initiate enforcement action on behalf of the government and a qualified right to pursue them if the government declines to prosecute the case itself. The New York State False Claims Act, which only covers fraud against the government, is a best case example of this. It contains model anti-retaliation protections, rewards whistleblowers, and empowers them to initiate enforcement actions, all of which is supervised by government officials to protect the public's interest in fair and effective law enforcement. And the results of the statute, uh, I think, speak for itself, both in the city and state. Dangerous and illegal practices have been rooted out in government-funded health care programs. Corrupt and discriminatory contract practices have been exposed and eradicated. And complicated schemes against the city's pension fund stopped. And hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds, have been returned to New York taxpayers. And yes, this model can be expanded to beyond just fraud against the government. But whistleblower laws, whatever they are, can only work as well as they are administered. Government agencies need to actively recruit, listen to, and work with whistleblowers. Dedicated whistleblower advocates in government agencies, speedy and fair investigations, and prompt and open communication with whistleblowers can make all the difference. And, and what good is a whistleblower law, any whistleblower law, if people don't know about it? Government agencies and contractors can and should be required to inform employees, workers, and subcontractors about applicable whistleblower protections. And, and th this is not novel, by the way. MTA contractors are required in this state, New York MTA, to tell employees about the protection and rewards offered by New York state law, along with the contact information of the Attorney General and the MTA Inspector General. Why just MTA contractors? And when you think of who can be a whistleblower, I think we need to think more of just the archetypical private sector employee or government official who sees corruption at their office. Honest businesses that know of wrongdoing in their industry are increasingly taking advantage of whistleblower laws to report on scoff law or dishonest competitors because honest businesses are tired of paying an integrity tax by losing sales and profits to their wrongdoer competitors. And finally, New York State and city whistleblower laws can be, as pointed out, confusing and inconsistent as to who can qualify for a whistleblower, the type of illegal conduct that can be reported, the agencies to which conduct must be reported, and the remedies that are offered. New York City has the authority and opportunity to clarify, modernize, and strengthen these laws, as well as enact new laws to better serve enforcement agencies and better serve the public. Laws that protect, reward, and or empower whistleblowers send a message. 
that New York City and New Yorkers reject the discredited attitude that deems whistleblowers as traitors, snitches, or disloyal individuals. Instead, at their best, they establish a public-private partnership in the battle against fraud and illegality and for integrity. See something, say something, get fired. Become see something, say something, and the city's got your back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Can I call you Professor? Uh, just Greg is fine. Greg, Mr. Okay. Greg, yeah. So, yeah. Greg. Um, I, so you shared with us your thoughts on best practices yes. in the whistleblower law. You, you know, what do you make of New York City's law? There's a perception that New York City were the progressive capital of America with some of the strongest whistleblower protections. Is that fact or fiction in your opinion? There, there are some good things in the law and then there are some not so good things and among the, 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 the less attractive is how confusing it is and how limited it is in some areas. Um, it is unclear from a policy perspective why New York City law would protect someone who reports certain delineated agencies, yeah. DOI, the, the City Council, and the Public Advocate's Office, for example, but not others. It's, it's whistleblower bingo is not a good practice of law. If internally or externally, a public or private sector employee or independent contractor has information that's relevant to law enforcement, they shouldn't be retaliated against for reporting something to their superior even in the private sector, they're superior in their agency to not only city agencies, but, 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 but state and, and, and other enforcement agencies as well. If you want someone to come forward, broad, you know, someone says, when you, list, when you make a list of you have to report to X, Y, and A, B, and C, it means if you report to all these other agencies, you're not protected. So your criticism is that the reporting requirements are too rigid and prescriptive. And narrow. And narrow. Uh, all right. It's unclear to me. I mean, you know, the SEC actually went through this. So, so what, are, what are the ideal reporting requirements? That if, you, if, if someone who is a private sector employee or public sector is retaliated against for reporting illegal conduct or gross mismanagement, as the city law does, to their supervisor, internally to a private sector entity or internally to a public sector agency, and they are retaliated against, they are a whistleblower and should be protected. Um, you know, many whistleblowers try to work within their company, in the private sector, for example, because they think that if they go up the chain, someone will listen to them within their business. Most people don't think the companies that they work for are, are dishonest. If in going up that chain, internally to a private company, someone is retaliated against, that shouldn't be legal. So I'm going to quickly go through the five categories. Public sector, yeah, sorry. Go I'm going to quickly go through the five categories that I laid out. There's the question of who should be covered, right. what should be covered, what are the reporting requirements, what are the enforcement mechanisms, what are the remedies. On the question of coverage, who should be covered, the, Any, lo the local law covers public employees and public contractors and subcontractors. Is there anyone else who is not covered who should be covered? Sure. Com com People who work at companies who, for example, take the city's consumer protection law, who risk New Yorkers, not only livelihood, but data privacy, they might not be a city contractor. They are someone who comes forward and says, New Yorkers under the CPL or under, under other New York laws are in danger because of something at my company. They should be protected, and they should be protected whether they come to the government agencies or they go to their employers or corporate compliance department. Um, if you have a regulatory regime and you take the important, um, the important conduct that we care about, consumer protection, environmental law is an area where you know, state law sometimes sort of drops the ball in terms of whistleblowing. You, broaden the conduct, and you broaden the people to whom that person can report. And they say you don't fire them. You don't fire them if they have a reasonable basis for belief of not only illegal conduct, and this I think actually 12, 13, 113 does very well, or gross mismanagement. Um, that would be an example. I, mean, I can think of others, but you know. I, I, what about 
What about the forms of misconduct that are covered? The law covers criminality, conflict of interest, corruption, gross mismanagement, and abuse of authority. Is that sufficiently comprehensive, or should it include I, I, other forms of misconduct? I actually think that in, in, in 12113 it is, is actually a very, compared to some other laws, a very good broad description. For example, state law 75B covers illegal conduct. In this case, the city law is a little bit better because it covers gross mismanagement and abuse of authority. Now, it covers gross mismanagement and abuse of authority, but then it narrows in the next paragraph by saying, but only if it's by another city officer or employee or an officer of the contractor or subcontractor that happens to be dealing with the agency. But in terms of going beyond just illegality and to what the law states as gross mismanagement or abuse of authority, that's actually a really positive aspect of current law. Uh, it goes beyond civil service law section 75B, for example. And, 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 and Sorry, I'm getting too detailed. And if I understand correctly, the, the three comprehensive whistleblower statutes applicable to local and state employees are the admin code, civil service law, and labor law. Uh, there are some others. There, the New York False Claims Act covers retaliation um, for all fraud against local and state governments, and the state law um, gives uh, really anybody, private or public sector employee, the right to sue New York City or, or to sue um, any, any entity in the state, actually, for retaliation, not just for reporting fraud against the government, by the way, but for taking actions in furtherance to stop a fraud. And I think that's important, too. I think that's a, that's a part where the law, uh, New York City law, is not clear. Report, you, you said itself, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, it, you, know, you want to be proactive. If someone is internally in a company or an agency and says, no, I don't, I don't want to do that, <laughs> they should be protected, even if they don't then go and fill out on their own, which they, you know, is, is, is tough to do if you're not, a, you know, well, I had problems understanding all the reporting requirements in, in, in 12.113, or hire a lawyer. The State False Claims Act covers in furtherance of efforts to stop a fraud, right. which, by the way, itself could be improved. But I guess to your earlier point, Unlike the state statute, the civil service law, which limits um, whistleblower protection to violations of law, right. the, the local law extends well beyond violations of law. Yes. To gross authority, I'm sorry, gross mismanagement and, and abuse of authority. That, I think, is the good part about, uh, is, is one of the positive aspects, and there are others of, of, of So of that's, that's one of the upsides. What about the enforcement mechanisms? So local law designates DOI as the enforcement agency, it, it creates a private right of action for public contractors and subcontractors, but fails to do so for public employees. Should public employees have a private right of action under the city's whistleblower law? Well, first of all, I'm not, I think the word employee needs to be expanded in the day and age of the, as I said in my opening testimony, of independent contractors. But um, we're specifically referring to public employees in the, in the strictest sense of the word. Should, should public employees, the 400,000, people who are directly employed by New York City, should those employees, any of them, all of them, have a private right of action under the city's whistleblower law? Absolutely they should. And here's an example of the inconsistency, since I mentioned the, the FC False Claims Act. Why would we give a New York City employee a private right of action for retaliation to stop a fraud against the government, which, section, which state law does? But you don't give that employee a private right of action for all the other conduct within city law. And the inconsistency itself speaks to, you know, no one would write a policy like that. So a city employee that sees a fraud against the government can, and is retaliated against can sue, can sue the city under state law. But they can't sue the city under the city's law for all the other conduct that city law covers that's not fraud against the government. Gross mismanagement, um, conflict of interest, crimes, other than in, in Section 75B. So I, I, I like to and, say you want to end And there, there is a private right of action available under state law. Uh, there is for illegal conduct, yes. For public, for city employees. Yes, certainly for the False Claims Act, absolutely. For retaliation, yes. What it about under, under civil service law? Um, I believe that's their case, yes. It's, it's, and, and, and by the way, these private right of actions are not all equal. There are different statute limitations. Right. There are, so it's the, Section 215 has a two-year statute of limitation. Section 740 of the labor law, which covers labor law violations, has a one-year. The False Claims Act has a 10-year statute of limitations for retaliation. 
So, you know, uh, fraud against the government is, is bad, and there are some great laws, but so is environmental and consumer and, and misuse of authority as well. And I'm, I'm, you're, you're just correct. There's lesser protections for those kind of conduct is something that doesn't make sense and that should be improved in city law. Okay. Final question. You go through, you wait months, if not years, to secure whistleblower protection. You finally do. Are you clear about the remedies that result from whistleblower protection under local law? Uh, not entirely, no. There's, for public employees, um, it's not spelled out, for example, that you're entitled to more than just your back pay. Um, this local law and the same law for contractors uh, actually says double back pay, so it's, it's confusing of who you are, whether you'll get the same remedy. Um, uh, there is, um, uh, you know, otherwise than that, the big, of course, the distinction is there's no private right of action for one group and there is for another. Um, and that, you know, to have a remedy without an enforcement mechanism is, is, is a fundamental difference. Thank you for your testimony. No. Our next panel will consist of the Commissioner of the Department of Investigations, Margaret Garnett. Commissioner, can you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth and the whole truth in your testimony before today's committee and in your response to council members' questions? I do. You may proceed. Good morning, Chairman Torres, members of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. My name is Margaret Garnett, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Investigation. Thank you for inviting me to address the committee on intro number 1770 the proposed legislation in relation to whistleblower protections for employees who face adverse personnel actions. New York City's whistleblower scheme is foundational to DOI's mission of rooting out corruption, fraud, waste, and other wrongdoing from city government. New York City is a leader in fighting municipal corruption, in part because of its comprehensive system of duties to report and cooperate, strong protections for employees when they act on those duties, and an independent and robust inspector general system in the Department of Investigation. In my testimony today, I'd like to first provide the committee with an understanding of the rules that currently guide how and when wrongdoing must be reported. Second, explain how the current whistleblower protection statute functions. Third, summarize DOI's recent experience with the current whistleblower statute. And finally, highlight some concerns and recommendations that I hope the committee will consider as it evaluates the proposed legislation. There are currently three places in the city's governing documents that set out important aspects of the city's system for reporting wrongdoing. One is Executive Order 16, which mandates the affirmative obligation of all public officers and employees to report corruption, fraud, and other wrongdoing, or risk their jobs and professional advancement if they do not. Executive Order 16 also mandates that all public officers and employees cooperate fully with DOI investigations. This duty to cooperate with DOI investigations is also included in Chapter 49 of the City Charter within the list of duties of public officers and employees. The third place is Section 12-113 of the New York City Administrative Code, also known as the Whistleblower Protection Statute, which protects public servants from retaliation when they act on their duty to report wrongdoing. As amended by Local Law 33, which expanded whistleblower protections to include complaints about children's educational welfare, health, and safety, and later to include officers and employees of vendors who have contracts with the city valued at $100,000 or more. The current whistleblower protection law, codified in Section 12-113 of the Administrative Code, has five elements that must be satisfied in order for an individual employee to be protected by the law. First, the complainant must be an officer or employee of a city agency or of a contractor with city contracts over $100,000. I'm sorry.
Second, the complaint must involve corruption, criminal activity, conflict of interest, gross mismanagement, abuse of authority, or the health, safety, or welfare of a child. Ordinary mismanagement, disagreements about policy or procedures, or objections to decisions that are within the lawful discretion of agency heads or elected officials are not covered. Third, individuals must make these complaints to DOI or to any member of the city council or the public advocate or the city comptroller, each of whom has a duty to refer those complaints to DOI. Employees and officers of contractors may also qualify for, for protection if they make such a report to the city chief procurement officer, their agency chief contracting officer, or an agency head or commissioner of the contracting agency, all of whom must then refer the complaint to DOI. Individuals making a report concerning conduct involving the health, safety, or educational welfare of a child may also be covered by the statute if they report wrongdoing to a superior officer or to the mayor. The fourth element is that the complainant must have suffered an adverse personnel action, which can potentially include a wide range of things like termination, demotion, suspension, disciplinary action, negative performance evaluations, salary reduction, denial of promotions or raises, or significant unwanted changes in duties or work environment. Fifth and finally, the adverse personnel action must have been the result of the individual's report of the wrongdoing at issue. When DOI receives a complaint that alleges retaliation, even if it does not specifically reference whistleblower protection or the statute, we conduct a thorough inquiry. The current law requires that DOI acknowledge the receipt of the complaint within 15 days, provide a final written statement to the complainant explaining how the matter was resolved, and if the complaint of retaliation is substantiated, provide a report of our findings and recommendations to the relevant agency. The law also calls for DOI to conduct public education efforts so that employees and officers of covered agencies and contractors are aware of their rights and responsibilities under the law. In addition to our other public outreach efforts, DOI conducts regular outreach to the city's workforce through both in-person and online corruption prevention training. In fiscal year 2019, we conducted 449 in-person corruption prevention lectures that reached over 16,000 city employees in person, an increase of 15% from the previous fiscal year. In addition, more than 33,000 employees also completed online anti-corruption training through DOI's citywide e-learning module. I believe these efforts are key to increasing awareness among the city workforce about corruption risks, their obligation to report wrongdoing, and the related whistleblower protections when they do. Before I move on to discuss DOI's most recent whistleblower annual report, I'd like to clarify the meaning of whistleblower as I have generally used it in my testimony so far. New York City's laws classify individuals as a whistleblower only when they raise a claim of retaliation in their employment as a result of reporting wrongdoing. In contrast, the term whistleblower is often used colloquially or in the media to describe any individual who reports wrongdoing of any kind. I believe we are very fortunate in New York City that thanks in part to DOI's long and storied history as an effective anti-corruption investigator, hundreds of city employees step forward to report corruption, fraud, criminality, waste, and abuse of authority to DOI each year. Many, many more public servants voluntarily provide crucial information about these issues to DOI in the course of our investigations, even if those investigations were not initiated by a report from a city employee. These actions are vital to DOI's effectiveness, and these individuals should be commended for embracing good government principles, promoting integrity and confidence in city government, and ensuring that city operations and services are not damaged by the corrosive effects of corruption, fraud, and waste. The fact that the law does not label these individuals as a whistleblower until there's an allegation of retaliation in no way diminishes the significant contribution to government integrity made by the officers and employees who report wrongdoing to us every day. Indeed, as I will discuss in a moment, a very small fraction of these whistleblowing individuals allege or suffer workplace retaliation for reporting wrongdoing. I view this as a tremendously positive sign because it indicates that a wide range of city employees understand their duty to report and duty to cooperate, that DOI's overall commitment to complainant confidentiality is effective and respected, and that where the identity of a complainant does become known, there is widespread understanding among city supervisors 
that workplace retaliation for reporting wrongdoing is illegal in New York City and will not be tolerated. By October 31st each year, DOI is required to submit a letter of report to the mayor and the speaker of the city council describing the complaints from the previous fiscal year that fall within the whistleblower law. I have attached a copy of our most recent fiscal year 2019 whistleblower letter to my testimony today so the committee members can see those statistics in detail. DOI began posting these letters to our public website with the letter that I've attached in 2019 to further government transparency and public education on whistleblower issues in New York City. In fiscal year 2019, which covers the period from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019, DOI received 32 complaints of retaliation from whistleblowers, two more than the prior fiscal year. These complaints came from individuals who alleged job-related retaliation or sought workplace protection for reporting misconduct in city government. To substantiate a complaint, DOI must find that all five elements of the law have been met, as I described them a moment ago. Although the law has very specific requirements, DOI applies a broad lens in this area, meaning that DOI carefully reviews all complaints of alleged retaliation, regardless of whether the complainant specifically invokes the law or identifies themselves as a whistleblower. In addition, we generally take a broad view of whether any individual qualifies under each of the five elements. In fiscal year 2019, DOI substantiated five whistleblower complaints, the highest number of substantiated whistleblower retaliation complaints in a single year since at least 2014. The previous year, for instance, saw no substantiated investigations. Given that the numbers have historically been small, I do not believe there's any particular reason for this one-year uptick or any conclusion that should be drawn from a single year statistic standing alone, other than that this was a year with complaints that merited substantiation. Our statistics include whistleblower complaints received and investigated by DOI and also by the Special Commissioner of Investigation for the New York City School District, which has a reporting function to DOI. In fiscal year 2019, three of the five substantiated matters were within the investigative jurisdiction of DOI and two within the investigative jurisdiction of the Special Commissioner. The five substantiated matters were remedied in the following ways. Two of the five individuals were reinstated to their positions with full back pay. For one additional individual, DOI directed the agency to cease adverse unwarranted personnel actions against the individual. And in the case of the two Department of Education employees, SCI directed the school's officials to reinstate the two employees to their position with back pay and remove disciplinary and other relevant documents from their personnel files. I turn now to highlighting some concerns and recommendations for the committee's consideration as it evaluates Intro 1770 and the current state of New York City's whistleblower regime. First, as I mentioned earlier, currently the foundational duties that underlie whistleblower protections, including the affirmative duty to report and the duty to cooperate, and the details of what those protections mean are found in three separate places. Any revision of the whistleblower protection statute provides an opportunity to integrate those various elements in a single place, as well as give legislative status to the duty to report. Doing so would incorporate the full scope of New York City's anti-corruption whistleblower system into one comprehensive piece of legislation. It would also provide an opportunity to specify that the duty to report and the duty to cooperate on matters relating to corruption or criminality applies to officers and employees of contractors with contracts above $100,000 with the city. Currently, a version of these duties is standard language in the city's contracts, but is not required by law. Under current law, employees and officers of contracts are protected by the whistleblower law if they report corruption or fraud in connection with their city contract, but they are not legally bound to report or legally bound to cooperate in any investigation. Including these duties alongside the protections would better mirror what we require and expect of city employees. The opportunity to create parity on these matters is particularly important as the city relies more each year on private entities to provide a variety of public services and as we embark on several major infrastructure projects that will involve significant private contracts such as the construction of borough-based jails and the east side resiliency project. 
These proposed revisions would clarify for city employees and contractors that they have specific mandates to report corruption and to cooperate with corruption investigations, and would pair these duties in one statute with what is necessary to effectuate them, which are legal protections when employees are retaliated against for reporting or cooperating. In my view, the duties and the protections go hand in hand, and placing them in the same piece of legislation would provide clarity as well as make any future needed revisions or amendments to the whistleblower rules easier and more comprehensive. Consolidating these existing concepts in the same piece of legislation would also support the addition, which I believe is necessary, of clear language in the statute requiring all city agencies and those city contractors subject to the law to notify their employees of this coherent set of duties, responsibilities, and protections. Second, DOI would also recommend that the statute be revised in the relevant places to clarify that full whistleblower protections are afforded to those individuals who make reports to the Special Commissioner of Investigation for the New York City School District about matters within the school district. In a similar vein, DOI also does not object to the language in the proposed bill that would extend whistleblower protection to those who are subject to workplace retaliation when they cooperate with the City Council as a legislative or oversight body regarding the types of complaints covered by the current law. In other words, those matters that relate to corruption, criminal activity, conflict of interest, gross mismanagement, or abuse of authority. Third, DOI recommends that a time limitation be placed on when retaliation complaints can be made. There is currently no statute of limitations in the law, but the longer an allegation goes unreported, the harder it is to uncover the facts and ensure that valid claims are vindicated. Based on our review of similar state and federal statutes and our own experience as the city's whistleblower investigator, DOI submits that the appropriate time period in which to report claims of retaliation should be two years from the date that the complainant was informed of the alleged adverse personnel action. Fourth, DOI does not oppose the addition of some requirements that DOI provide regular updates regarding its whistleblower investigations to the complainant and also to the council speaker where the claim of retaliation arises from cooperation with a council investigation. However, we would recommend the proposed language be revised to require only that whistleblower investigations be completed as promptly as practicable and that the 90-day period apply only to the frequency at which DOI will re provide required status updates. Based on our experience conducting these investigations, it is not realistic to assume as a default that such investigations can be completed within 90 days. As in all of our investigations, DOI is focused on finding the facts and leaving no stone unturned. However, we do recognize the anxiety that workplace retaliation creates for whistleblower complainants and do not oppose the transparency and increased sense of urgency that a 90-day status reporting requirement could bring. Fifth, DOI supports the addition of language that establishes a clear plan of action when allegations of retaliatory action are made against the DOI commissioner or executive level DOI personnel. We agree with the proposed language that such allegations would best be referred to the city's corporation council, but recommend including specific language that the corporation council would be empowered to hire a qualified outside attorney to serve as an acting deputy commissioner for the purposes of investigation and recommending action on the allegation, if the nature of the allegation warranted such appointment. We respectfully submit that this procedure should not apply to allegations that relate to adverse personnel action taken by DOI supervisors below the commissioner title executive level. DOI currently has its own internal inspector general who is capable of carrying out DOI's obligation to fairly investigate and take action on this type of lower level retaliation complaint as it would for any other city agency. With the revisions and additions I have suggested here, the city's whistleblower statute would be a robust comprehensive law, one that could be a national model for what is expected of those who witness corruption in government and what is expected of government when whistleblowers step forward and suffer retaliation. I cannot stress enough how important and distinctive New York City's overall whistleblower system is composed of both strong obligations and robust protections. It has important symbolic value as a signal of the city's commitment to the ideal of honest government, and it also yields results. DOI regularly initiates important investigations based on public servants who heed their affirmative obligation to report corruption. Our investigations into retaliation complaints have restored the livelihoods of those who honored that duty. 
A comprehensive and effective whistleblower statute is good government in action, holding public servants accountable and protecting them when they do the right thing, and fostering a culture that does not tolerate corruption, fraud, self-dealing, or waste of public funds. Thank you again for the opportunity to come here and comment on this important issue. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Uh, we've been joined, we were joined previously by Councilmember Rivera, Powers, and Kalos. We're presently joined by Councilmember Salamanca. Um, Commissioner, I know you said we cannot over interpret one year's worth of statistics, but it's, it's notable that we went from only one substantiated case of a whistleblower over the span of five years to five in FY 2019? And, and that was your first year as commissioner. So for, it, ha for half of yeah. the, the, the city's fiscal year runs right. from summer to summer. So I became DOI commissioner on December 10th of 2018. So for approximately half of that period, um, I was the commissioner of DOI. But do you think that spike was random or was there something done internally to drive more substantiation? So I can't point to anything that was done internally to uh, increase that number. I think I, I'm always um, skeptical of one year's number in isolation. I think that if we saw over time a similar uptick, I, I would find that notable and want to understand why. I think um, a single year um, when there were a lot of unusual events in that year, I, I, I just, I'm not prepared to put too much weight on it or interpret that by itself. Could you explain as briefly as you can the, the process of a whistleblower investigation? Right? I come to DOI, I seek whistleblower protection. What does that process actually look like? Sure, so um, I think the first thing I would say is that we aim to cast a broad net so that any claim that contains within it any complaint that we receive at DOI that contains within it a allegation that the person was retaliated against in their employment, um, we try to sweep that up in a net and initially classify it as a potential whistleblower retaliation investigation, even if the complainant doesn't self-identify in that way. Um, so our complaints department, as well as our intake people in every squad at DOI, are trained to identify and flag things that allege retaliation. Um, once we have those complaints, we would typically reach out first to the complainant, that would be standard practice, um, to meet with them and understand more about what their allegation is. And then from there, the investigation would proceed in the way that any other DOI investigation with similar allegations would proceed. So um, we go about gathering the relevant city documents, including emails, phone records, underlying documentation. Can, can I briefly interrupt? Sure. Is there a dedicated unit for whistleblower investigation, or does it vary depending on the agency? It varies depending on the agency. So it's done so. by the unit that oversees the agency? Yes. Okay. Yes, the I'm inspector sorry. general that oversees the agency that is alleged to have retaliated um, is the squad that would be assigned to the whistleblower investigation. The only way that would vary is if there was some kind of conflict of interest or, or uh, ethical conflict where I could imagine a circumstance where members of a particular squad had investigated the underlying allegations and where I might view it to be more appropriate for different investigators to look at the retaliation claim separately. So that's always a possibility, but the default would be that the matter would go to the squad that oversees the agency alleged to have retaliated. Um, it, it seems like we have a respectful disagreement. Just judging by your testimony, I get the impression that yes, the system is, um, has room, there's room for improvement, but you believe it works fundamentally well, that it's fundamentally a, a strong system. Is that a fair characterization of your? Yeah, I, I do. And I think that the, the numbers really tell the story in the sense of you see consistently over you know, the, the years over which we have good records with, you know, three different DOI commissioners, two different mayors, um, that the numbers of city employees um, who come forward to report wrongdoing to us remains extremely high. 
Um, the number of DOI investigations open based on that information remains high. The incidents in which uh, city employees refuse to cooperate with DOI investigations remains extremely low and rare. Um, and, and I think from, from our perspective, looking at the statistics as well as our overall experience, what the, to me the more logical explanation for the relatively low number of substantiated retaliation complaints is that retaliation is thankfully relatively rare um, and that where we found the evidence to support the allegation it's substantiated. I, I can speak certainly to the ones from fiscal year 19, five were substantiated. In every case the agency took the action that was recommended based on the outcome of that investigation. And as far as I'm aware, I don't believe we've ever had a situation at DOI, certainly within the last 20 years, in which a retaliation claim was substantiated and the agency refused to reinstate the person or take the other action that we recommended. Okay. So I'm admittedly a skeptic about the effectiveness of our whistleblower law, so I just want to break down the law category by category. I want to start with the question of who is covered and who should be covered. The admin code covers city employees as well as city contractors and subcontractors. As I noted earlier in my opening statement, it fails to cover those who were formally or prospectively employed, you know, protecting against blacklisting, or it fails to cover interns. Should the city's whistleblower law cover prospective employees, former employees, and interns? So um, I'll confess that I haven't given a lot of thought to those categories sure. before today. I mean, I think that it would be possible to cover um, prospective employees, I would imagine, that if a person, presumably the way that that would work is a person would allege that they were denied city employment for which they were otherwise right. qualified solely in retaliation for um, having been, you know, the difficulty is that the tricky thing is to, you have to imagine a person who is not a city employee, but is in a position to identify wrongdoing of the kind that is specified in the statute, Pro reports that wrongdoing or cooperates in the investigation of that wrongdoing, subsequently applies for a city job and is denied that job because the prior cooperation or reporting is known. I think if you had a situation like that, I, my, my suspicion is that those facts would be pretty rare. Um, if you had a situation like that, I think that it could make sense to give that person protection. The difficulty, it seems to me, is that the hiring process is quite a different process from the process by which persons are subject to adverse personnel action in a job they already have. So there might be some difficulty in investigating that um, in a way that could really get to the bottom of the answer. Um, what we have found is that in the case of adverse personnel actions, there typically is quite a paper trail. Um, many people are involved, there's emails, there's phone records, um, and we're able to get a pretty good picture of this timeline and how that circumstance came about. Um, I think the hiring process is a little different, so that would be my hesitation. So it sounds like you have no objection in principle, but investigatively complex, is that? Right, I have no objection to the principle that someone okay. should not be denied the opportunity for city employment for which they otherwise would be the top candidate because they've been involved in reporting wrongdoing. I, I be firmly in support of that principle. I, I have some concerns about how you could design the statute in a way that would make it effective to get at those situations if they occur. That's a fair concern. Um, the city's whistleblower statute protects those, or seeks to protect those, who have suffered, experienced retaliation. What about those who are threatened with retaliation that never materialized? So as I said, DOI, we try to cast a broad net in terms of what we consider to be retaliation. and. Um, we are in generally regular communication with complainants on our underlying investigations. Um, so certainly if, we, if a complainant told us that they had been threatened with retaliation or that they, then it certainly has happened that complainants have told us that, you know, they, they sense a chill, everybody knows I'm talking to you, you know, I'm no longer in meetings that I once was or things like that. Um, 
we take that into account, and when we ultimately make referrals to the agency, or you know, that's a circumstance where I could imagine us making a referral to the agency, or if it were appropriate to the law department or to City Hall, to say that we think that inappropriate conduct is occurring in terms of the treatment of this employee, and corrective action needs to be taken. But but but, but just a strict reading of the law is your do, do you construe the law to prohibit? The threat of retaliation does. Can can the threat of retaliation constitute a basis for granting whistleblower protection? No. Okay. There has to be some action taken. So, so then the question is: Should a th should the threat of retaliation constitute a basis for granting whistleblower protection? I think I'd take a similar view that, in, as a principled matter, I think that it should be illegal to threaten employees with retaliation, and so my only question would be. Well, let me, let me take an egregious case. I'm, I'm a city employee, and I receive an email from my supervisor. I am going to fire you if you speak up. Right. I know you're talking about I, I, And I can I, prove it. Shut right? your I, mouth, right? Shouldn't I receive whistleblower protection if I can prove it that definitively? Yes. I, I, I think yeah. that it would be consistent with the principles okay. of the whistleblower statute to include threats of retaliation as an actionable claim. Yeah. Okay. Not as compelling. What about the fear of retaliation? Even, even in the absence of a threat, I, I, I've, I've shared information with DOI that, it, that has aided an investigation into corruption and fraud, and I, and I fear retaliation. Should the fear of retaliation be the basis for whistleblower protection? I, on that one, I have to say no, because I, I think that when people come forward, there are a range... I, you know, I've worked in law enforcement a long time, so in my, in my former life, um, I dealt a lot with informants, with cooperating defendants, and um, those situations are not so different uh, from the city employees who come forward in my role as DOI commissioner in, in this way, which is that people have a huge range of motives for doing so, from the purest heart to complicated personal motives and everything in between. People's experience of what that experience is like also covers a huge range. For some people, it's, it's quite uncomplicated. You know, they, they, they saw something, they called, they come in to be interviewed. Um, it doesn't present them with much anxiety, um, and they go on with their lives. And for other people, it's quite a different experience, and again, everything in between. So I think, I don't think that a person's feelings are actionable in almost any area of the law. I think the way that we handle that is to try to reassure complainants that um, if they are, do suffer retaliation, we'll investigate that thoroughly and work to protect them if those claims are substantiated. We educate them about what the law requires, what their rights are, um, and I think that that is really the most that can be done because I don't see sort of as, as a lawyer as well as as DOI yeah. commissioner, um, I don't see a way that you could effectively craft a legislation that would create some action or a remedy because you fear retaliation. I guess what, one of my frustrations with whistleblower law is that it's reactive, right? It, it waits for the prospective whistleblower to fall victim to reality, retaliation, and then it, it, it offers a path to a remedy. And you know, when you are suffering retaliation, when you lose a, a job, that can be, that's catastrophic for most of us, right? Most of us cannot survive the loss of a job. Most of us cannot survive months or years of lost income. You know, what if DOI had the ability to grant provisional or presumptive whistleblower status in anticipation of retaliation? Is that something that you would object to in principle? So, you know, it, it, that, that's a concept that uh, my staff and I have done a lot of research on to look to see, are there other places in, because really, um, at, at bottom, the whistleblower protection law in New York City is is a kind of employment law, right? It, and it, 
it makes illegal certain kinds of employment actions and gives the employee subject to them certain kinds of protections, right? So, so in that way, the, the structure of vindicating those rights should have a lot of parallels, whether that's sexual harassment, um, gender or racial discrimination, um, other kinds of retaliatory firings that are prohibited by a wide range of employment law contexts, whether federally at state level or in the city also has very robust protections for private and public employees for certain kinds of discrimination. And um, when we looked around for a model of how something like that could work, what we we could not find any such model. And, and what we found overwhelmingly is that the structure of employee protection law in, in the United States is to create remedies to, after the fact, to reinstate for back pay, for emo damages for emotional harm or, or medical bills or damage to reputation or professional advancement. You know, there are different circumstances have a range of different um, remedies that are permitted but we could not find any example of a sort of temporary protective bubble once you file a claim. And as we thought about how that might work in the city, that started to make a lot of sense to us because um, many city employees work in a role in which they're essentially a sort of fungible cog. You know, they're one of 37 procurement analysts in their agency. But many, many hundreds of more city employees, particularly those in more sensitive positions, um, work in a role in which they have access to sensitive information, they're empowered to speak on behalf of their agency, um, they are the only person in the agency who does their job, and the circumstances of even a temporary whistleblower protection, it seems to me, could create enormous logistical problems for city agencies. Um, to, because it's impossible, that, that in order to work, that bubble would sort of have to come down at a very early stage before we had been able to determine. I'm not sure if I'm following what logistical challenge. If Well, I'll if, give you an yeah. example yeah. from your own staff. I assume you have a pretty small staff in your council office um, and that everyone who works for you has access to sensitive information about um, this committee, about your role as city council. Um, and if there were a circumstance where one of those people had accused you of wrongdoing and came to DOI about it and we were investigating, I, I suspect that in that kind of small and intimate city office where there's a lot of relationships of trust, that you would not feel comfortable under those circumstances allowing that employee to continue to have access to your personal calendar, to your email, to sensitive matters within your council office. Because he reported me. Well, yes, but yeah. imagine. But, but, that, but that's precisely the kind of conduct for which I should not be able to retaliate against him or her. I'm not talking about retaliation. Or, imagine a situation where you deeply believe that the allegation is founded in nothing and that when the investigation is over, you'll be vindicated. Likewise, your staff member believes that they are correct, and when the investigation is over, they'll be vindicated. To try to resolve those matters on very limited information, I, I became I became increasingly convinced on the, and on the advice of my staff that such a regime is not workable, and that it would be an outlier in how the U.S. law treats employment actions of any kind, in which the remedy is reinstatement, back pay, additional financial damages, and. I would be reluctant to recommend a... I, I just want to challenge it for a moment because, because I, just following the hypothetical that you laid out, e even if I'm the target of a whistleblower complaint, I do reserve the right to modify duties, demote, based on reasons unrelated to the reporting of the complaint. So, so that, that right would, even, would continue even in a world where there was presumptive or provisional um, whistleblower status, right? The purpose of the whistleblower status is to prevent me from retaliating against an employee simply because he or she reported to DOI something that he or she believed was wrongdoing on my part. Right. So, 
the form that that would take would be at the most, if, if, if what you're saying is that you would retain the right to demote, change duties, even Well, like fire. if you decide to not show up to work for a week, that's a basis on, on which you can be fired. Okay. Right. So, so, that, so it's clear that the firing likely resulted not from the report of the wrongdoing, but from actual performance, from actual... But you're imagining a world where that's clear, and in our experience with these situations, it's it's not so clear. None so of this none of this is clear. But but it, and I don't want to dwell on this, but it seems to me granting someone whistleblower status at the beginning before retaliation could spare them years of misery, years of lost income, years of reputational damage. You know, in, in some cases there's a sense in which not everyone can be made whole, right? The, the, the experience of, of going through the process and losing back pay and really the psychological trauma of it can do irreparable damage, right? The, you know, the notion that you can be made whole at some level is a fiction. And so I, I want to see if there's some mechanism by which we can prevent the retaliation in the first place, but, but I understand it's complicated. I don't want to dwell on this, but if you have any final remarks on this or... No, I... I think the only final thing I would say on that point is that um, I think the world you're envisioning where maybe we would send just a warning letter to the agency, this person has provided information to DOI or is cooperating with DOI, this is a reminder that you are not allowed to retaliate against them for that behavior. Um, that's a world that I don't think many, I mean, when I think about the hundreds of employees each year who come forward to give us information and the many hundreds more who cooperate in DOI investigations, one of the things that makes that effective and that they're relying on is that we will keep their identity confidential for as long as possible to do so. And in many cases, the identity of the original complainant or tipster never becomes known, even where the matter becomes a criminal case, or we issue a public report, or there's some other publicity about the outcome, um, we, take that, we take that responsibility of confidentiality very seriously. So and I think any change in this area would have to incorporate due consideration for that, and that any sort of warning letter to the agency or protective bubble before retaliation happens would necessarily entail essentially outing that employee to yeah. their agency? I mean, you could have both, right? You could allow for confidentiality or you can allow for provisional whistleblower status depending on the preferences of the complainant, but, but I don't want to dwell on this. The question of what forms of misconduct should be covered. The administrative code covers corruption, criminality, conflict of interest, gross mismanagement, and abuse of authority. Should the city's whistleblower law cover forms of misconduct beyond what is presently covered? Um, I, I think it's pretty comprehensive, I have to say. You know, I, I, I think that um, the language is designed to capture both criminality, which is usually the feature of most other whistleblower laws, but goes beyond that to encompass things that are not necessarily criminal, but that go to um, various forms of public corruption that are not criminal, but nonetheless should be acted on. So I think the coverage is pretty comprehensive. Do you track the number of complaints from each category? Uh, we do not break down complaints into those categories, um, often because many kinds of conduct fall, would, would argue Overlap. fall within more than right. one. Yeah. So I want to get to that. It seems to me I could be wrong. The meaning of criminality, straightforward. Corruption, straightforward. Conflict of interest, straightforward. What is not so straightforward is the meaning of gross mismanagement and abuse of authority. Mm -hmm. So how, how exactly would you define that? Can you give me an example? First, what's the difference between mismanagement and gross mismanagement? And second, what is an example of gross mismanagement separate and apart from criminality, corruption, and conflict of interest? Um, and the same for abuse of authority. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, I think, I'll start with abuse of authority because I think that's a little bit easier. Um, I think- That there, is easier, yeah. <laughs> there might be many circumstances in which abuse of authority would overlap with the city's conflicts of interest law, 
but because the city's, con so for example, I, I know you know this, but maybe the public doesn't and others don't, um, the city's conflict of interest law would prohibit me as a commissioner from directing my subordinates to do personal things for me. So, you know, I, I can't require an employee at DOI to, to drive me somewhere for a personal errand. I can't uh, ask my secretary to take care of personal matters for me or make the birthday invitations for my child's birthday party. Um, but I think there are versions of that kind of behavior um, abuse of subordinates that would not fall within kind of the technical, fairly technical requirements of the conflict of interest law. So I think one example of abuse of authority would be a misuse of your city position for personal gain. And I think there are species of that that might fall just outside of the technical requirements of Article 68, but that would still be actionable. Um, and that would be viewed as an abuse of authority, that you are using somehow your authority over subordinates, your city position, the conduct and mission of your agency for s any purpose other than the public interest or the mission of your agency could arguably fall under that in a way that's not necessarily criminal. Um, the gross mismanagement, I think, like many terms in the law, it's, it can be a gray area, and I think reasonable people might disagree about a given situation of mismanagement. Like, uh, take a situation in which a agency head consistently delegated nearly all their authority for major decisions to a subordinate. And we received a complaint that um, you know, major decisions involving hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, or significant policy decisions that are supposed to be and historically have been in my agency, signed off on by the commissioner, are not even being reviewed by her at all. I have no idea how she spends her time. This is coming from a, a, an employee in the agency. And these matters are going out the door under a delegated signature with no commissioner level review at all. That's just an example of a situation that I think would give us concern, again, depending on the surrounding <laughs> facts, and could arise to the level of Well, since, since these phrases are so open-ended, does DOI have rules or guidance that clarifies the meaning of gross mismanagement or? So we don't have an internal memo that lays that out. I think, as with other things, we would be guided by precedent. Like, have we had situations like this in the past? How have we handled them? Are we handling them in a way that? Because I'm thinking, if I'm a if I'm a prospective whistleblower and I know of mismanagement, and I'm figuring out, you know, is this gross mismanagement or just mismanagement? There's there's no guidepost available to me to make that determination. I have to go according to my own judgment, and there's no guarantee that DOI is going to agree with my judgment. Well, yes, there's no guarantee yeah. DOI. Is or, going or let me let me ask that question differently. Should we simply remove the qualifier? Should we simply say mismanagement? Well, the reason why I think the qualifier is useful is that um, I'll just use my own experience. I run an agency of 600 people. I think anyone who is in a management position, um, that there, are, there, there will always be employees who disagree with decisions that you've made that are within your lawful discretion, are not corrupt, are not self-dealing. Um, there will, because human beings are running city agencies, there will be situations in which um, someone makes a choice that in retrospect is not the best choice. Maybe they've been promoted beyond their competency and they make mistakes, even significant mistakes. And I think that it is important to give some latitude within agencies to manage their employees in a way that can handle disagreements about policy, sort of the ordinary kinds of management mistakes that can happen, um, that we don't elevate those kinds of disagreements to a situation where someone cannot be demoted, transferred, even terminated. Um, because one thing I think that sometimes gets lost in these debates is that 
substantiating a whistleblower retaliation complaint is a finding of wrongdoing. But like, in order to do that, you will, we, DOI, will be finding that a city supervisor or agency head engaged in wrongdoing. They broke the law. And I, I think that finding should be reserved for situations that merit it. And certainly we at DOI, I think, take very seriously our obligation to communicate to complainants, to supervisors in the city, to the public, that it is illegal in New York City to retaliate against city employees for reporting wrongdoing. And when we're evaluating complaints, we take, I think it's fair to say, just reviewing the history, I haven't had many of these yet myself, but reviewing the history, we take a generous view of whether the elements are satisfied. And that if it is a situation where the overall tenor of the situation is that a em city employee has been retaliated against for reporting wrongdoing, that we want to try to vindicate that situation. So I, I don't think, again, based on just my historical review of what happened before I arrived, I just did not see situations where a hyper-technical parsing of these categories is what resulted in a complaint not being substantiated. So I'm not saying that it can't happen. Yeah. Um, a, a future DOI commissioner, I suppose, could direct a hyper-technical parsing of these five elements to deny people um, vindication. What I can say is I have not seen that um, happening at DOI. Well, what if you had, what, what if I were a parks employee and I had information about a poorly managed program in the parks department, right? Not grossly mismanaged, but a poorly managed, and I, and I shared it with my local council member, Calman Yeager, and, and the information I shared informed his questioning at a hearing, it informed the city council's performance of his oversight function, and then my supervisor finds out, said you spoke to the city council without authorization, you're fired. Is, is, that, is that something that should be permitted? That I as a constituent provided information that aided my local council member's performance of his oversight functions and then I was fired? Should that be permitted under our whistleblower law? So, I think all, what I'll limit myself to saying about that is that I, I do think, like I can speak to what would happen if that person came to DOI. I think it's a little bit more complicated when you're talking about the council, mainly because DOI is within, you know, as a legal matter, we're within the executive part of the city. We share in the city's attorney-client privilege. We have, we're obligated to keep things confidential that... And the hypothetical I have assumes no violation of confidentiality laws or privacy laws. R right. So, right. So, so that's why I'm hesitating a little bit because I could imagine situations yeah. in which a lower level employee not authorized to speak for the agency, not authorized to break the privilege, to disclose confidential deliberative matters, that there's a separation of powers issue there. I, I don't want to get too bogged down in my political science hat in my former life, but I, I think when you're talking about city agency employees vis-a-vis -vis the council, it gets a lot more complicated. So I wouldn't want to opine on that specific situation without giving it more thought. What I can tell you is that if that person came to DOI and they were cooperating in a matter, any matter under DOI's jurisdiction, and we found that they'd been retaliated against, we would take action on that. So it's okay to report mismanagement to DOI, but not to the city council? <laughs> because of separation of powers? Is that the... No, I, I, okay. as I said, I think there are a lot more complications yeah. that I wouldn't want to speak sort of in a, in a flip manner about those. They're very complicated issues when it's vis-a-vis -vis the city council. I can only speak for how it would work within DOI, and I think that, as I said, we have not historically, nor do I imagine going forward, we would be parsing finally the distinction between gross mismanagement and ordinary mismanagement if employee was retaliated against for making that report. Reporting requirements. So under the administrative code, a uh, public employee or contractor or subcontractor is required to report it either to DOI or to a select set of elected officials, the controller, the public advocate, a local city council member, and then under Executive Order 16, all public employees have an affirmative obligation to report. Uh, who has a duty to report beyond public employees? So 
The contractors have, and their employees, have no duty to report. Um, there, it is possible that... The contractors have no duty to report? They have no duty to report. And one of the suggestions that I made earlier in my testimony is that um, if the council were inclined to evaluate you know, a, a preamble or something like that to the whistleblower statute that would incorporate the duties that give rise to the protection, it would be an opportunity to apply those duties so to... If, so if the NYCHA monitor found corruption and fraud at the New York City Housing Authority, the monitor has no legal obligation to report that to DOI? That's right. Even that's though it's city funded? That's right. Wow. Okay. The, I, I will say that the city's contracts typically include standard language about cooperating with any investigation by DOI, opening your books and records, and so on. But we have seen contracts that don't include that language, um, and, and there's nothing that requires that language by law. So there's the duty to report. Does the duty co is, the, is the, the duty to cooperate, is that universally binding? Uh, no, as I said, it's, it is standard language in the city's contracts, um, but in a variety of circumstances, we have seen contracts in the course of other investigations that did not have that language. Would it apply to this, the monitor of NYCHA? I believe the monitor does not currently have a contract with the city. So if, if the city chose to include that language in its contract with the monitor, then, then it would apply to them. So hence the need for a statutory change. Yeah, I, it, it's, it's certainly our recommendation that since employees of city contractors are protected, but right now there's a disconnect between what we expect and require of city employees, our own employees, versus what we require and expect of employees of vendors who are working on city matters. So both groups of employees are protected by the whistleblower statute if they're retaliated against, but right now only the city employees have a duty to, have a legal duty to re report and to cooperate. Well, what ha so the, the duty to report applies expressly to public employees? Yes. What happens when you fail to report? Uh, you can be subject to disciplinary action or termination. And how often does that transpire? Um, very rarely, but in my time as commissioner, I know I've signed at least one letter that went to the agency head informing them that an employee of theirs had refused to cooperate. Now, the law allows an employee to report indirectly through elected officials. Yes. What happens if I report it to a local city council member? Is the council member legally bound to report it immediately? Um, well, I think the implication of the statute is that there'll be prompt reporting. Um, and I think prompt reporting would be necessary for DOI to do its work. But if the matter relates to corruption or criminality, it's supposed to be promptly reported to DOI. And what happens when an elected official fails to report it immediately to DOI? Um, so we haven't had that situation that I'm aware of since I've been commissioner. Yeah, but hypothetically. Yeah. I'm sorry? Hypothetically. Um, it, again, it's complicated with elected officials because they have an independent status. So um, hypothetically, depending on how serious I thought the situation was, in all likelihood my first step would be to notify the speaker of the council that that had occurred. Um, I don't know what rules the council has internally in terms of its own ethical proceedings or other proceedings, but that would be the first step that I would take if I thought it was a serious breach, is to notify the speaker of the council. No, I, I find the selection of elected officials in the whistleblower law to be arbitrary, right? If I report corruption, fraud, gross mismanagement to my local council member, then I'm eligible for whistleblower protection, potentially. But if I report it to my local borough president, then I'm ineligible. Like, doesn't that strike you as arbitrary? Shouldn't, shouldn't what matter is, is what you're reporting, not to whom you report it? Well, um, so I know that this question of whether the group of reported, like reportees, should be brought in was um, addressed pretty thoroughly. At, the council held a hearing in 2002, a series of hearings in 2002 and 2003 um, about various proposals to expand the list of eligible reportees. And I think a concern that was raised then, which I would still share now, is that part of the duty to report and part of the embodiment of reporting in the whistleblower protection statute is to ensure that to create the most likely situation where allegations will be 
investigated effectively and in a timely way. So I think the list is actually not random, except that I, you're going to object to what I'm about to say. So um, the list, I think, derived from who are the elected officials in the city. So for example, um, you know, a community board would be different than your city council because they're not elected, so they don't have the same obligations. They don't have the same duty to serve in the way that city council members do, the public advocate, the comptroller. Um, now, borough presidents are elected, and I think that if, if, the count, if this committee felt that that was an appropriate addition and it were paired with the same obligation that the council, public advocate, and comptroller have to report relevant complaints to DOI, that we have no objection to that. But I, I, I do think that I, I heard briefly the tail end of the previous witness's testimony um, that essentially any kind of reporting to any entity should qualify, and, and I would really urge caution on that because I do think that limiting the list to... But, but I, let me, I, I'll play devil's advocate. Sure. I, and I don't know what is the correct interpretation of the law, right? But when you mean a council member, I think what is meant is the office of the council member, right? If you if you report it to a staffer, does that qualify as reporting it to the council member? Well, as I said, we... Because most of our interactions with our constituents or with constituents are mediated with through staff. So does the... Right. No, I mean, I think that DOI would interpret a complainant bringing that matter, calling your general office number and speaking to a staffer right. as as qualifying, just like at DOI, I, right. I don't personally answer the but, phone but that's at my, DOI. Because my office, like your agency, we're, we're agents of the city, right. right? We're institutions embedded in the city of New York. The same is true of a local community board, right? You know, if, if, I, if I go to a local community board and report corruption and I have a great relationship with the district manager, you know, why should I not qualify for whistleblower protection simply because I went to a district manager rather than a council member? It seems arbitrary to me. So I don't think it's arbitrary because yeah. I think that um, the goal of the, the list is to create, a, to create a balance between, as you said, not, not arbitrarily cutting people off from whistleblower protection while also serving the interest of ensuring that those kinds of complaints are funneled as quickly as possible to the entity that can actually investigate them, which is DOI. So community boards and, and their members don't have the same duties and obligations as elected officials or as DOI. They might not be as trained or as versed in what should be done with those matters. They don't have the same responsibilities. They don't have the same staff. And so I think in, in evaluating that list, there needs to be very thoughtful consideration about a balance between, again, not, not cutting someone off from protection where they, we might think in principle they deserve it, but also not damaging the likelihood that those complaints will be followed up on and investigated properly by expanding the list beyond what is, is reasonable and practical. Enforcement mechanisms. The city's whistleblower law designates DOI as the enforcement agency. DOI conducts the investigation for determining whether, for the purpose of determining whether whistleblower status should be granted. Um, what happens when a member of the city council is the target of a whistleblower complaint? But DOI has the authority to investigate whistleblower complaints, but at the same time, the city council has the authority to investigate member misconduct. How do you reconcile DOI's authority to investigate whistleblower complaints with the city council's authority to investigate itself? How do you reconcile it both in theory and in practice? Well, I think if, if DOI received a whistleblower complaint that involved a member of the council engaged in any of these categories of misconduct, we would view ourselves as empowered to conduct an investigation and would investigate that. Um, it's true that DOI does not have the power to remove a sitting city council member. So, you know, in, in, in contrast to the kinds of other situations we've been talking about where we can direct a city agency, 
we've substantiated this and our recommendation is that the person be reinstated or that the yeah. disciplinary matter be removed from their well, file. Well, I think it's, it's clear that you have the authority, but there are complications that arise when two entities are investigating the same matter. So how do you cope with that complication? Um, like does, because the law, it's not clear to me that the law addresses this situation. No, I, what, what I can say is that, um, And this is barely a hypothetical, so. Yes, I know you're presenting it as hypothetical. Um, that the way, we would, the way we typically handle matters in which there's a potential overlap between a DOI investigation and an internal counsel investigation is first by picking up the phone and speaking to um, the, counsel's, the counsel for the counsel, <laughs> um, the, the general counsel's office at the counsel and making sure that we have, and I think certainly during my time as DOI commissioner, we've had good professional communication between the council's office um, for the council and our squad that investigates the city council um, in terms of ensuring our access to documents, ensuring that whatever we are doing and the council's internal process um, doesn't create problems one for the other. So I think that's always gonna be the first step um, I think because of the separation of powers issues that if you had a situation in which you could not agree, uh, there's no one to go to, right? There's no, there's no higher authority um, in a dispute between the city council and DOI. Um, I think I've, it's, I've been fortunate so far, one year in, not to have had that situation, but um, you know, I think if we couldn't agree, then DOI would carry on with its own obligations. Which would be to proceed with the investigation, is that? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, we've been joined by Council Member Mark Traeger. What is the, do you track the, the length of your investigations? Do you, do you have stats on the median length of your, of DOI whistleblower investigations? Because we heard, and I know you cannot comment on specific cases, but we heard testimony earlier from Ricardo Morales, who observed that his investigation took a year and a half and that he went a year without undergoing an interview from DOI. Do you track the median length of whistleblower investigations? Um, and, and if so, what is the median length? So we do keep track for all of our investigations. We have a case management system that notes when the investigation was opened and when it's closed. Um, I don't have that specific stat in front of me right now, but I could provide it to your staff after the hearing. Um, because we do have the ability to run those kinds of numbers. I, I, I would just note that I, I don't know why, Mr. I wasn't here for Mr. Morales' testimony, but I don't know why he would say that he wasn't spoken to during that time. It's not accurate. The, the legislation proposes a three-month deadline, uh, which you're adamantly against. Are, are you opposed to any deadline? Like, a, what about a one-year deadline? W would you oppose that as well? Uh, yes, I mean, I think investigations are, if you asked me how long should an investigation take, I think my response would be how long is a piece of string. Um, it, it depends what you need the string for. And the same is true for investigations of all kinds, that there, the matters can vary tremendously in complexity. I think we have whistleblower allegations that could reasonably be disposed of in 30 to 60 days, and others that because of ongoing criminal cases that we don't control the timing of, or the complexity of the matter, or the difficulty of getting the evidence that we would be hesitant to close until we were confident that we had done everything we could to get to the bottom of whether the allegations were true or not true. And I think putting an artificial deadline on that doesn't make sense is not responsive to the reality of investigations and could potentially mean that investigations are closed at an artificial deadline when more could Look, be Look, it, it seems like no matter what we do, there's a trade-off, but how do we account, you know, justice delayed is justice denied, and the longer a whistleblower investigation is delayed, the greater the injustice, the harm done to the applicant, the complainant, how, how, do, we, how do we address that, if not through a deadline? Well, as I said, I do, I do think that um, some useful headway on that. I mean, first of all, I would say that in, certainly in the year that I've been DOI commissioner, I've not seen evidence that 
whistleblower complaints are, are languishing or not being given proper attention. Um, but the reality is that you know everyone is is overworked and triaging and and shifting their priorities of what is on their plate. So I do think that some it would be a useful measure, as I said in my um, testimony, to require that DOI provide updates every 90 days to a complainant. I think that having to write that letter uh, to update a complainant, yes, your matter is still ongoing. This is the current status. Um, does provide some use, potentially provide some useful additional sense of urgency beyond what investigators would already feel. Yeah. Although that letter could be as simple as your case is ongoing. That's true, yeah. but um, I, I guess an example that I would give you from, from my prior life is that when I was a federal prosecutor, um, the federal laws have, there's a Speedy Trial Act and there's certain dates by which things are supposed to happen but judges have the discretion to extend that time period um, based on a variety of factors. And when you, as the prosecutor, had to write a letter saying, I know we're coming up against the timetable, but here are the reasons why I need an extension, th the fact of having to write that letter and, and an agency can put in place measures that you need you know, additional supervisory approval to write more than three such letters requesting more time. So, you know, I do think that there, the, the utility of having to write that letter and the tickler that it provides, the potential tools that it would provide for me as commissioner of DOI to require higher level supervisory review for certain, you know, X number of such letters, um, I think would be a useful tool. I, I'm not promising that, um, it's a panacea, but I do think that it has some utility and is something we should try. Finally, the question of remedies. Uh, suppose DOI grants whistleblower status to a public employee. Like what, what happens next? What, what, what remedies does DOI typically recommend? So where an employee has been terminated, um, we would recommend reinstatement with back pay if that's what the employee wants. Um, thinking, just thinking about the five substantiated matters from the last year, um, two, only two involve termination, two of the five. Um, two involved steps having been taken such as um, unwarranted negative performance reviews, denials of promotions, um, change of duties, essentially icing an employee out um, and the recommendation there, which was accepted by the agency and implemented, was that all those negative materials be removed from the personnel file, um, that the individuals be restored to their prior duties and responsibilities, and in those, in those two cases that the supervisors who had implemented the negative reviews and other action be themselves disciplined and removed from supervision of those employees. Um, and in the, th the fifth situation, it was one where um, the employee had, I just want to make sure I'm sufficiently anonymizing, the employee had alleged and we substantiated essentially retaliation from his colleagues for having been a reported wrongdoing and a failure on the part of the agency to protect him from retaliation by his colleagues um, to include supervisors, non-direct supervisors, but other supervisors in the agency um, denying sort of ordinary promotions and, and in, in essence going along with the hazing that colleagues were imposing for the employee having reported wrongdoing. Now typically when DOI conducts an investigation that results in a report and recommendations, those recommendations are exactly that, a recommendation. Are, are your whistleblower recommendations binding upon agencies? Could agencies, in theory, ignore your recommendations in part or in full? Yes, so in theory they could. Um, in preparation for this hearing, I, I went back as far as I could go back. I couldn't find any instance in which we'd substantiated a whistleblower claim and the agency had not implemented the remedy. I, I think if we had that situation, um, I, I certainly wouldn't hesitate to take that to the law department or to City Hall or whoever the right authority is over that agency. 
um, to notify them that an agency was continuing to not take corrective action against a substantiated whistleblower. So it could be the case that you're an applicant who waits years for a determination, and then once you receive a whistleblower status, there's no guarantee that's that right. you will actually receive reinstatement and back pay. Now, uh, there's no guarantee, that's right. I, I, I will say that um, there have been instances. So, yeah. no so you know, we provide a public, uh, the law requires us to provide a letter to the whistleblower informing them that their matter has been substantiated um, and what our recommended action is to the agency. So I think, you know, certainly, um, there, there are potential remedies in the courts or other remedies, but right now the statute does not provide. Um, if an agency refused to abide by our recommendations, there's no remedy in the stat that's within the statute. So, which, brings me, which brings me to my new, so that's a problem. And my question is, in the event of an agency ignoring your recommendation, which is theoretically possible, should employees have a private right of action? so that you have some mechanism by which to vindicate your rights as a whistleblower. So I'll confess that that's not my area of expertise, yeah. the, the private right of action for employment is, is, so I'd hesitate to opine on that. I, I do think. Although it's worth noting that contractors and subcontractors have a private right of action. And, um, and so do employees under state law. So the question is, right. should city employees, employees enjoy a private right of action under local law, at least in cases where the agency has ignored DOI's recommendation? And, and that will be my final question before. So I think that that is certainly workable and the state law provides okay. a model for that. Um, so I, I, I have no position in opposition to that. It's just advising about how you would do it is just not my area of expertise. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. I think Councilmember Kalos, you have questions, right? Is anyone else has I want to start with a thank you to our oversight chair, Richie Torres, for looking into this very important issue. Uh, I want to thank our uh, DOI Commissioner Margaret Garnett for uh, your amazing career of work and uh, all the investigations you've been conducting <laughs> since you came in. Uh, and in particular, uh, I, I know that it I would say it's not a week goes by that we're not uh, passing along a, a person who is trying to blow a whistle at an agency. Uh, and I think, I guess, one thing that would be helpful, I think, for anyone watching at home is just when do the whistleblower protections kick in? Because I think in our conversations, you've mentioned that sometimes a complaint isn't sufficient to trigger those whistleblower protections, then I did have a specific question because we, we did have somebody who I believe uh, sh shared information with us that I believe should be qualified for the whistleblower protections who did have an adverse employment action. So I did want to get an update on that case to the extent you can share. So I can't talk about any ongoing investigation um, okay. because those are confidential. Well, 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 that being said, I'll just say th thank you for your partnership on that ongoing investigation and just working with us on just when people are in the agency and just if anyone's watching at home and you work and you're a city employer or watching the live stream, uh, you can come to any council member or you can go to DOI directly to share any concerns that you have and you will get uh, whistleblower protection. So I guess the first part of the question is, when does somebody who's making a complaint to their council member or to the DOI uh, go from just a person who's giving a tip to getting whistleblower protection? So the, the whistleblower protection law applies when an employee has suffered an adverse personnel action, which could be, uh, runs the gamut from termination on the one hand, um, all the way down to an, an unwanted change in duties and um, work environment, so sometimes it could be something at potentially as small as I used to have an office and now I'm in a cubicle. I used to supervise 30 people, now I supervise two people. I used to be regularly included in certain high-level meetings and now I'm not. Um, under the right factual circumstances, those types of actions could qualify as adverse personnel actions if they were taken in retaliation for reporting wrongdoing. Um, so. The, even though we colloquially and in the media often refer, use the term whistleblower for anyone who reports wrongdoing, 
the whistleblower within the meaning of the statute, um, you get protection once when you have suffered an adverse personnel action. But I, I mean, I would just echo what you said, Councilmember Kalos, about the variety of ways um, that civilians and city employees can report wrongdoing to their council member. Um, I know many council members have the same range of options that DOI has. We have an online form. You can be anonymous if you want. We have a hotline number. Um, you can walk in off the street to our offices at 180 Maiden Lane um, to report wrongdoing. Um, and we assure people of confidentiality for as long as we're able to. And I guess one piece I would just share personally based on our work together and with our chair is just, I, in addition to talking to DOI or the council member, I also found that if somebody's part of a labor union, engaging that labor union's uh, duty of fair representation, uh, I have found that with one person in particular who I call a whistleblower, but I guess does not necessarily meet the man name, uh, we actually just had a hearing, Stephen Warner, a member of HPD blew the whistle on the fact that he saw that he thought about 200,000 units or more uh, uh, units of affordable housing weren't getting registered with the city and that developers might be getting upwards of a billion dollars in subsidies without making those units available. We worked with the organization of staff analysts uh, to make sure that he did not see any adverse employment actions and I'm proud to say he still has the same job he had for 30 years. Um, and we've been able to move forward on that issue. So thank you and um, I would like to add my name to introduction 1770. I think that it would be helpful to expand the coverage. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or, okay. Um, I have a few more questions, Commissioner, if I, uh, do you, I know you conduct briefings, trainings about the whistleblower law. Do you conduct those trainings for contractors and subcontractors? Um, yes, we do. Okay. So um, we have conducted them and, and continue to offer that. I think, as I said in, in um, my testimony, one of the, an additional benefit of ensuring that the duties and obligations are extended to contractors as well as the protections is that it would provide an opportunity for the city to require that city agencies and contractors affirmatively notify employees of their duties and their protections, much the way that now if you go into any city agency, um, you'll see a poster for OSHA, for EE the EEO rules, um, various requirements, and I think effective means of ensuring that employees know about both their responsibilities and the protections that are available to them. Um, so we are, we provide, as I noted in my testimony, um, we reach thousands of city employees and employees of contractors every year, but um, it's not 100%. So I think anything additional that can be done to uh, ensure that employees that are working on city matters, whoever their employer is, know about their duties as well as their um, protections would be of great benefit. Does your training or briefings include whistleblower rights and responsibilities, not only at the local level, but also under state and federal law? Um, no, we focus on the city's whistleblower laws. Um, so, uh, and, and actually I would I extend invitation to the council and their staff if you haven't yet viewed um, our computer-based training for, for city employees, we'd be happy to arrange a viewing. Um, it's excellent, I think. No, I, I applaud your efforts to conduct outreach, but we're only touching a small percentage of the overall workforce, right? Out of 400,000 employees, how many, how many city workers underwent the training? Uh, so in the last fiscal year, the combination of in-person and online, it's about 50,000. Should we require all city employees to take the online training? How do we, how do we expand? So we, we are working uh, towards that with DCAS. Um, so uh, we are actively, you know, we, we offer in-person training anytime an agency asks us to do it um, because we think the in-person trainings provide an important additional um, way of reaching people, reaching city employees. Part of the reason that the e-learning module was developed was to expand um, our ability to reach more city employees. So we have been working with DCAS along with the Conflicts of Interest Board, who has their own annual training, um, to put together a citywide module of required training um, to try to increase that number. So we're actively working towards that. 
And would you favor expanding the scope of those trainings to include rights, responsibilities, and remedies, not only at the local, but also at the state and federal level, so that people can be kept informed about the full range of protections available to them as whistleblowers? Um, you know, I think I wouldn't inherently object to that. I, my only concern would be um, it takes quite a bit of time to develop a high quality training. So I wouldn't want to delay continuing to provide the existing training we have, which focuses on DOI and the city's rules about corruption and whistleblower protection. Um, I wouldn't want to delay that. Um, we would probably need a little bit of help to add state and federal protections, but it's not impossible. Yeah, so I feel like you have, you and I have a, I, th I think I would characterize it as a fundamental disagreement because for me, the purpose of whistleblower law is to protect those who blow the whistle from retaliation. For me, I only care about two things. Are you reporting fraud, abuse, and corruption? And did you suffer retaliation, right? And if you meet those two criteria, you should be, you have a right to be protected. You have a right to be made whole. Whereas it seems to me you are more concerned than I am about the manner in which the whistle is blown or the person to whom it is reported Right, I think you, you object to expanding the universe of reportees. I'm wondering, to just to Council Member Kalos's point, what if, what if an employee, instead of reporting it to DOI, a NYCHA employee leaked fraud, corruption to Greg Smith, and he wrote an article, which then prompted a DOI investigation, and the investigative outcome is the same. Why shouldn't that person be protected under the law? Because that person's violated their duty to report those matters to DOI. I, I, I do not believe that reporting matters to the media should qualify for whistleblower protection. So you would object to removing those reporting requirements if? Yes. Okay. So I just want to recap, I think, where we agree and disagree. Uh, as far as I can tell, you have no objections to protecting prospective employees, former employees, interns, those who are susceptible to back blacklisting. Yes. That's right. Um, I sense you're skeptical about the notion of granting presumptive or provisional whistleblower status. Right, because I think in practice, I, I don't, I've concluded it's not workable. And you're, you would object to changing the forms of misconduct that are presently covered under whistleblower law. All right, I think the present list is comprehensive. Right. And you would, you would object to expanding the universe of recognized reportees? Uh, yes, I mean, I think your example of borough presidents strikes me as in the spirit of the existing list, so. But beyond that, no. That, correct. Okay, and you would object to any deadlines, a year, two years, three years, any deadlines whatsoever? Right, I, I, I just don't think deadlines of that nature will produce the result that you yeah. seem to want. But you do support or, in prin or have no objections in principle to a private right of action for public employees, particularly in the event of an agency ignoring a DOI recommendation? Right, in, in principle, I, my principle is focused on would such a measure inhibit reporting or inhibit effective investigation? And I don't see how that would have a negative effect on either of those. So. I do, so I don't have an objection on that basis. We, we have some serious differences. Those are going to be interesting negotiations, but I, I appreciate your testimony, Commissioner. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Who else is coming? Uh, Pat Russo. Tonight. Good afternoon. My name is Pat Russo. I am uh, the president of Chef Choice Food Distributor in Brooklyn, New York. I currently, uh, well, I had since 2000, contract to deliver food services, food to uh, New York City public schools. And I'd like to give you an example of a whistleblower action that should serve as a template for your amendment to uh, the whistleblower laws. In 2015, a New York City 
food inspector, a supervisor of an inspector came to me and told me about uh, misman gross mismanagement and tens of millions of dollars in inappropriate taxpayer money being spent on foods. I think that would qualify as gross mismanagement. Came to me with uh, information on an inappropriate relationship with executives from the Department of Education, Office of School Food, and certain manufacturers of school of uh, products that were delivered to the school. And I went to the SEI as being a retired NYPD sergeant. I knew the parameters, and I previously had provided information to SEI that resulted in a couple of um, executives in DOE school food being terminated in 2000. So that's the reason being he came to me. And he also came to me because English is his second language, and he didn't have the confidence in his ability to articulate his complaint to them. So he asked if I would call SEI on his behalf. I did, and you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for him that I did, because his life has been turned upside down since I reported, and it's been, let, it's been discovered that he was, in fact, the whistleblower. He's been the subject of harassment by his supervisors. He's been, for the last three and a half years, he has zero job responsibilities. He's in, in other words, he's in a, a rubber room sitting at his desk with zero to do for eight hours a day. He is seeing a psychiatrist where he's suicidal. He's been the subject of corruption complaints, false corruption complaints, false sexual harassment complaints that have been orchestrated by his supervisor. And his supervisor is still in a position of authority at the New York City Department of Education, Office of School Food and Nutrition. And I think it's something, it's an example of why the whistleblower law needs to be amended. And, and if, I, if I understand the situation correctly, um, he is ineligible for whistleblower protection because he reported the, the misconduct through you rather than directly, is that? He, well, we're, we're currently fighting that. Okay. He's been found ineligible to receive it because I actually made the report. Right. But their, their timing in their letter is, is off. And you agree with me, what should matter is not how you report it. What, ma what should matter is the fact that you reported it well, and one, that you suffered retaliation. One million yeah. percent. Yeah. And, and, and the commissioner mentioned something about going to the press. And we did go to the press when, when, when we discovered that we believed the children were in imminent danger because, because of their inappropriate relationship. They had failed to put dangerous school food items that were being served to the kids. They would fail to recall the product. And you could Google it, the pizza with mold on it, chicken with metal and bones in it. And, and we felt that that was an imminent, imminent danger. And I don't know if you remember the, uh, the incident of a fourth grader in the Bronx in 2012, choked to death on a meatball. I, I think everybody would remember that. If you Google it, you could find a fourth grader in a school in the Bronx choked to death on a meatball. Does anybody know that at the same exact time that that took place, that there were incidents of plastic being found in meatballs, in the same meatballs that he choked on? There were incidents reported to the school food inspectors, and that was completely covered up by the administrators, the school food administration. So I, I believe we were appropriate when we went to the press and reported that, that there was a possible danger to the students. All right, thank you for your testimony. Um, thank you. Okay. This was our final panel, so this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>